one. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our weekly COVID-19 media briefing with our county executive, Mark Elrich, Dr. Travis Gales, our health officer, and also Dr. Earl Stutter, who is the director of our office of emergency management and homeland security. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and I will be hosting and moderating today. For the members of the media, uh, many of you already know the drill, please do uh, ask for permission to record on that chat. And also, once we're ready for the question and answer portion of this presentation, you can go ahead and request to ask questions of our presenters this afternoon. And with that, being said, I open the floor for our county executive, Mr. Elridge. So good afternoon, everybody. I'll uh, go through a brief, uh, a brief briefing again today. Uh, our case count today was 59. Before anybody gets excited and wants to ask me how great it is that our number is this low, our case count yesterday was 103. And this goes to the point that we've been making over and over again is that we do not have consistently low numbers and we have numbers that are high um, during the course of a week and we have numbers that are, are better than high. Still not as good as some of the earlier numbers we had. On the bright side, our test positivity rate is staying at 2.9%. Um, as you know, last week <clears throat> we announced the establishment of a late night alcohol sales program that allows food service establishments with no prior violations, um, their history of citations um, or closings due to COVID related violations to apply for a permit, which would allow alcohol service from 10 to 12. We've had a few hundred businesses that have applied and we've had inspectors out this weekend monitoring activity. Um, this is absolutely critical because this will only last as long as people continue to comply with what we asked them to do. And if we reach another point as, as we did earlier, where we did not see compliance af after 10 o'clock at night, <clears throat> then we'll be going back to where we were before. So I want everybody, you know, particularly if you're a patron, if you like going out and you want to be able to go out and get a drink after 10, please observe the guidelines because it won't just hurt the business when we cut, if we have to go back, but it's also going to take away an opportunity you have to do something that's a little bit more normalish. So we're not just asking the business owners to enforce some asking anybody who's listening to this and as a patron to do what we, you know we're asking you to do to help keep the business open so you can enjoy it and so the business owner benefits from the additional hours of operation with alcohol. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Stoddard provide you with more information on that. Um, we're pleased to see our testing <clears throat> numbers going up and I wanna thank every, everybody, all the reporters for emphasizing this. We continue to emphasize that we want everybody to get tested, that the CDC guidelines no longer say you need to be symptomatic. They've, re they've uh, reaffirmed the necessity of testing people even if they're asymptomatic, just to reinforce why. <clears throat> if you're asymptomatic, um, you may have COVID and you may be spreading COVID and you don't know it and your friends don't know it. And so when we're seeing these cases every day, the 103 on Monday and the, you know, the 59 from you know, today, it is very likely that people did not know that they had come in contact with somebody who had COVID. And when you're asymptomatic, you're not gonna know and your friends aren't gonna know and you're still capable of spreading. So if you, um, if you have the time and lots of people have the time, please go out get tested, we can schedule you, but you can also do walk-in and there are a wide variety of places now in the county that are getting, that are doing testing. Uh, we te yesterday we tested 699 people, Monday we tested 1,246. Today the county is testing at three locations, Gaithersburg, Wheaton, and Silver Spring, but there are more locations and if you go to the county website, you can get a complete less list of other sites that are testing, including many of our partners who are doing tests around the county. Um, tomorrow we'll be testing at Germantown, White Oak, and Rockville. And again, please go to the website for times and locations. Um, we are in the uh, fourth phase of the EARP program that was launched this week. 
Um, earlier this week, we announced the County Emergency Assistance Relief Payment Program is expanding to include financial assistance to more low-income households who do not qualify for other uh, types of state support for this program. We've expanded the eligibility uh, criteria to include financial assistance to support low-income families where adult household members are experiencing lost income because someone in the household has contracted COVID-19. In the first phase of the program, we were able to serve about 5,200 households who received the $1,020 uh, checks. Um, eligible households already receiving benefits under the program may be eligible for an additional amount as part of the second grant and no action is required by those households as supplemental checks will be issued by the Department of Health and Human Services. And again, for further information, please go to the county website. Uh, the county provides financial assistance that will increase access to full day uh, school age childcare during viral learning. We are now accepting applications to support school age childcare providers that operate licensed childcare programs in public school buildings, as well as help eligible fam families pay for full day care during virtual learning. Uh, we have a $7 million special appropriation was made to fund this effort. And uh, we've put out $1.8 million to in reopening grants for full day school, school age children's child care services in Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, there's $5.6 million in tuition assistance for full day school age child care services that's offered by licensed child care centers, registered family child care center homes, and a letter of compliance program located in the county. And the application period for the reopening grant and the tuition assistance runs through November 30th. And for more information on the application process and how to apply, visit our COVID-19 website. Um, a little correction regarding Halloween guidance. I want to clarify that we have not canceled Halloween or De Los Muertos in Montgomery County. We are providing guidance to people that will help minimize contact. Remember, you're asking children to take candy that may have been handled by somebody that you have no idea what, whether they're sick or not and placed into a bag. And uh, obviously all, can, all contacts like that carry some risk. So we're suggesting that people follow guidelines and celebrate the day differently this year, but we have not canceled it. Um, just as we adapted with graduations and birthday celebrations, we need to adapt with Halloween. Voting in elections. We are a little less than a month away from election day. We've been encouraging people to vote by mail and the response has been tremendous. If you have not returned your application for a vote by mail ballot, please do so as soon as possible. Important, when you request your mail-in ballot, please choose the by mail US mail option not the internet email option. As I've said before, if you do the internet thing, then people have to transcribe your ballot onto an actual ballot that can be read by the machines. Um, the more people that do that, the slower it's gonna to take to get the counting done. So please choose the US mail option. And for voters who choose or must vote in person, early voting will run through October 26th through November 2nd. Um, if you're voting in person, I encourage you to vote early to minimize the lines, make sure you're wearing a mask, and continue to social distance. There will be 39 centers around the county, and you can vote at any center. You, so don't look for your traditional center, because most of those aren't going to be open. And don't worry about whether the center you want to go to is in your voting district or outside your voting district. The ballots at all voting centers um, will contain everything you need to vote. And so you don't need to be only vote at the center in your district if that's not convenient to you. And if you're not a registered voter, the deadline to register to vote is on October 13th. This week, ballot boxes were installed around the county, drop box information, installation date, and locations will be included when you receive your mail-in ballot. And I think there's also a map online. Remember, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I want to encourage um, people to get a breast exam and support breast cancer research. Um, remember, your Montgomery County is, you know, our science quarter and the, the work being done, the life sciences does a lot of things. And one of the things people work on up there are finding 
cures and treatments for breast cancer and other cancers. And that work is, is happening in Montgomery County. Um, that's one of the great things about what we've been able to develop here. But please remember to get tested. That's the most important thing we can tell you. Um, and with all that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Gales. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Wednesday. And as the county executive mentioned, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I don't know if it comes through on my screen, but I'm wearing pink today uh, in honor of the month. And uh, there are lots of activities that are sponsored, although a lot of them have moved to a virtual platform. We encourage you to support those efforts and continue to support education and outreach to raise awareness about this significant issue in our communities. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of issues and as always leave room for questions. Uh, uh, the first thing I want to highlight is, as the county executive mentioned, in terms of our numbers, our test positivity is holding at about 2.6%. Our cases per 100,000 have ticked up this week. Uh, I think it got up to 8.9 yesterday and it's at 8.5 today. Uh, we, uh, fortunately, our hospitalization, hospital utilization numbers are holding firm and steady as well. Uh, I do want to also highlight one other issue that was brought up over the last several days. There have been comments across uh, the country that have intimated that the, the uh, COVID-19 is less concerning than the flu. Uh, and I think the national numbers show that COVID-19 nationally has uh, had more COVID-related fatalities than the last five years of influenza across the country. And when we look at the data specific to Montgomery County, um, our surveillance team was able to capture uh, influenza and pneumonia related deaths uh, from 2016 to 2018. During that time period, there were 456 deaths total during that three year time for influenza and pneumonia. And as of today, in the seven months that COVID has been in our jurisdiction, we have seen over 800 case uh, fatalities at 811. So just giving a point of reference uh, for folks at home who may have uh, seen that information put out. So we do take it very seriously. The last thing I want to comment is, is that there have been a number of cases reported uh, related to in and around the White House um, and particular events over the last two weeks uh, that we have seen a number of cases uh, be tied to, including uh, an event at the White House almost two weeks ago uh, with the announcement of the Supreme Court nominee uh, in the Rose Garden. We are, and, and it, as, as time moves forward, it is becoming uh, more clear that uh, there may be some concerns in terms of the level of contact tracing that has occurred. And so we are recommending for any of our residents, uh, Montgomery County residents, who may work in those spaces or may have been in attendance at any of those events or come into contact with close contact with any individuals who were in attendance or work in those areas, uh, we are encouraging you and recommending that you get tested. Uh, so that you can know your status, and then also allow for us to have a better accounting um, in terms of the scope of the potential uh, cases that may be tied to uh, that particular location, workspace, or those particular events. And if you go to our county website, we have an extensive website that lists uh, not only the different sites that the county supports in terms of testing, but also has an updated list of the different venues uh, and other healthcare providers who are offering testing throughout the county in addition to your own uh, personal healthcare provider. I will stop there, but as always happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Stoddard. Good afternoon. I have just a few updates. Um, so, as the county executive alluded to, we've had, I believe, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, I haven't got not got an update this morning. We had 160 businesses apply and receive permits for the late night alcohol sales program. Uh, there are a handful of businesses that have applied, but have who have previous citations, and we have held those applicants. And what we're going to do is we're going to develop a, a an appeals process whereby those applicants can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis based on the nature of their uh, previous citations and their uh, planning to address the things that were previously found to have been in violation and how they would address those moving forward. I would expect that some of those applicants will be ultimately accepted into the program. Some may not based on the, you know, if they have multiple violations of 
uh, across across the last several months, then that may be a case where we're not as uh, flexible there, but we're gonna review it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we will continue to do uh, enforcement related to that uh, late night alcohol sales program. We're gonna have teams out um, in the evenings and on the weekends to review the behavior during those periods of time for those businesses, particularly who have registered in and been accepted into the program. Uh, last weekend's uh, enforcement focused on the Bethesda, North Bethesda areas. We did not find any violations as the county executive alluded to. We will attempt to be as equitable as possible across the entire county to make sure that we're covering all the geographic areas of Montgomery County and not just disproportionately looking at one set of businesses or another. So uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, over the last several weeks and moving into this week, we have either had meetings or have meetings set up with a number of business industries to address their particular concerns. And so last Friday, we met with our escape rooms. There are seven escape rooms across the county looking at what we can do in that arena. Uh, I think that there's actually some space where we'll be able to find some, from, some accord with those businesses that will potentially allow them to operate in the future, but we're still working on it. Similarly, we did a walkthrough of the Maryland Soccerplex to allow them to uh, speak with us about uh, what plans they have for some potential tournaments that could include testing regimes and things like that to allow them to be safer, uh, particularly where there are people maybe participating from outside the county. So we're going to take a look at that. We have meetings. Uh, we had a meeting on Monday with our uh, hockey. So if you don't know, the Maryland Return to Play Commission report was modified to allow what was referred to as modified hockey. That's hockey without checking limitations on the penalty box and other rule changes that allow it to be less contact and, and therefore be a medium risk sport. Uh, we generally have followed the uh, Maryland Return to Play Commission and we'll do so in the case of modified hockey as well. And so we talked to some of the hockey providers in the county uh, on Monday to, to work, talk through that process and develop a, a process for them to submit plans to make sure they're in accord with modified hockey definitions. Finally, on Friday, we have meetings both with the movie theater industry as well as the live performance theaters. Um, as we previously said, we are looking very closely at the DC pilot and we'll, we'll likely utilize the findings of the DC pilot to drive how uh, live performances in Montgomery County will be done. Uh, I would expect that if, if our circumstances do not worsen and the DC pilot is successful, you will see live performances in Montgomery County in a, in a parallel to what they're being done in the district as well. So um, more to come on that, but we are meeting with those, uh, those, those folks on Friday. The last thing I want to touch on is uh, we chair our work with both the public schools as well as the non-public schools. We had our last uh, briefing with the non-public schools last Friday. We'll have another one on this Friday. Um, to date, we've received 26 non-public school plans for review. Uh, we're trying to get through those a handful a, a week. We have a team reviewing them that includes uh, Montgomery County uh, School Health as well as emergency management. Uh, and we're trying to really um, be thoughtful about the guidance we provide. As a reminder, we are not required to review their plans. They do not have to submit them to us, but we are just offering as a service where we're essentially reviewing their plans up against the CDC and state guidelines. And if there's anything glaring in terms of, you know, things that we think they should just include in their plans, we'll provide those. Uh, we are not, you know, uh, saying approving nor rejecting plans. We're simply giving them feedback based on their compliance in our view with what the state and the uh, federal government have released already. And so we're knocking those out a handful every week as they come in and we'll continue to do so as they are submitted. I uh, say so if people want to submit them, we have a portal that allows for submission of letter of approvals, letters or clarifications on the executive order or plan reviews for non-public schools. So I think that's all I have for today and happy to take any questions. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. And now we're gonna open it uh, for the question and answer portion of the briefing, reminding participants that this is a briefing for members of the media. The first question is for Jordan from Jordan Lindsay with my MC Media. And the question is for Dr. Gales. Thank you so much for hosting this and thank you so much for your time. Um, there's been reports of COVID-19 outbreaks in Montgomery County soccer teams. Um, I just wanted to get an update on the number of related cases and um, the number that, of people that are possibly in quarantine as a precaution. 
Sure. Good afternoon, and thank you for your question, uh, Jordan. So we are currently actually investigating a couple of cases, um, or it actually has met the definition of the state criteria for outbreak related to one of our club soccer teams and uh, one of the uh, that has spilled over into uh, one of the high schools. So we uh, were notified of some cases, uh, I think at the, the end of last week and over the weekend, uh, two initial cases that were tied to uh, the Potomac uh, Soccer Club. Uh, and as a result of those conversations and contact tracing investigation, uh, we have placed approximately 35 individuals on quarantine status secondary to uh, that, that potential exposure. Uh, and from my understanding, we have four cases who have tested positive as of today, um, secondary to uh, that particular investigation. Uh, we will continue to follow that uh, and as it moves forward and in terms of completing the contact investigation process, if we identify others who test positive, uh, we will you know, make the necessary recommendations to them as well as to any uh, teams around suspension of activity as well as any schools that need to take further action if any of their other students or staff may have been exposed. Okay. Next questions come from uh, Chris Gordon, MVC4, and Chris has questions for the three of you gentlemen. Chris. All right, I just unmuted and thank you very much uh, for these weekly briefings. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Stoddard and then I'd like to hear first from uh, the county executive and Dr. Gales. Uh, Dr. Stoddard, uh, last week you mentioned a drastic cut in the number of USDA produce boxes provided to the county each week. Have these numbers changed? And do you have any concerns about the county's ability to handle potential increase in the need for food assistance now that the stimulus talks have apparently been called off? I'd like you to answer that. But first, I'd like to ask the county executive and Dr. Gales uh, about the relationship with Montgomery County and the White House or Secret Service during the president's visit to Walter Reed in Montgomery County and his conclusion when he returned to the White House uh, don't let, uh, don't be afraid of uh, of uh, uh, the COVID virus. Don't let it dominate your life. Yeah, I think you know it's kind of an insensitive message to the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who've been affected by this. The millions of people who've been affected by it. Um, there are over two hundred thousand people who've died because of COVID and their loved ones. Uh, this is a real problem. This is not some trivial little cold you're going to get. And uh, I just found this comments insulting. Um, we had no interaction, at least not that I know of, uh, with them. Other than that, I thought his little grandstanding uh, drive outside was, you know, just inappropriate. Um, but I mean, he's he is who he is. Um, but I was just very, you know, very disappointed in that. And uh, you know, I think, you know, you can see by the, uh, the cases coming out of the little Rose Garden ceremony, what happens when you utterly disregard um, the safety measures that people tell you. Now, you know, these are all very well due to do people. They'll no doubt be able to find the very best in medical care and get the very best treatment and all that other stuff. I mean, the president benefited from government supplied health care at no cost to him with experimental drugs not available to most people. Um, so, you know, his valuation of his experience and trying to extrapolate that onto the American people is a little bit absurd because most people don't get what he got um, in terms of treatment. So he ought to be grateful and he should acknowledge the fact that he's a lucky person. He is not typical of what most people in this country experience when they get COVID in terms of treatment or anything like that. Okay, my next question comes oh, from- Oh, wait, oh, well, I, 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 yeah, I got, got some more questions in there. So I just wanted to say uh, on the on the issue that Kenny Vicky just alluded to, Montgomery County Police Department do interface with the Secret Service and do routinely do um, that interface uh, as it relates to any sort of presidential movements within Montgomery County, mostly from a perspective of making sure that the roadways and other, other things can be kept safe. They were in contact with the Secret Service throughout his stay uh, in um, in Walter Reed. Uh, I believe they also were in contact with the FBI. 
mostly pursuant to uh, we obviously had crowds outside that we were monitoring and making sure that it stayed peaceful and things like that. Um, we, you know, we we are often told, and that's this includes the police department, are, are told, uh, you know, after decisions are made and are just asked to support them once they're made. We're not often engaged and <laughs> we're never consulted on what the president's going to do or not do. And so obviously that poses a challenge for us when we're put in those situations of having to monitor. And now, sure. Dr. Sorry. I just wanted to ask you, because I'm asking this for a, a, another reporter about the counties, if you have any concerns about the county's ability to handle a potential increase in the need for food assistance. Yep. Yeah, I'll get, yeah. Yeah, so um, the short answer to the question is, I mean, we're certainly concerned about our long-term sustainability. We don't know when this pan pandemic is going to be over. Um, it, if you take what the uh, USDA was providing us, which was approximately 26,000 food boxes a week prior to the last two weeks, they dropped that down to about 4,000. The delta for the county to replace all those food boxes, if we could do it, would be something like $750,000 per week. And so obviously that is an unsustainable level of, of cost that would have to be incurred by the county to just feed, feed, you know, provide 22,000 more food boxes. Now we have taken five steps to sort of try and offset some of those losses. We've purchased bulk food and we're gonna be providing them to our food access providers. We're providing credits to the food access providers to shop at local distributors. We're connecting providers with other sources of food besides the USDA boxes. We're working on an agreement with the Capillary Food Bank and MANA uh, Food Bank to provide credits to the accounts of the food access providers. And then we're also rotating the 4,000 boxes that we have around. I will note, and I think it deserves the credit that it's due, the USDA boxes have increasingly gotten better. So we, we really wish we were getting more of them. The 4,000 boxes that now include both dairy and meat, in addition to the produce they previously considered. So they are very good boxes and we wish we were getting more of them, but it does create a huge delta. We are working through our uh, intergovernmental affairs people with our congressional delegation to, to advocate with USDA to increase our totals again. And, um, you know, obviously this is an area where, you know, we have, we've made substantial investments through the, both, both our CARES Act and our, and, our, and our county reserves in the food provision arena. And we'll, we'll likely continue to have to do that as long as this pandemic and the subsequent economic impacts, is, impacts persist. Um, but we do have a sufficient funding for now to address some of these gaps. It's just, yes, it will become increasingly hard to sustain as we move into the fall, winter, and spring months. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha from Fox 5 DC has a question for the county executive. On mute. Lorna, we're having a few issues. Can you go on to the next one and we'll get back to her? Okay, sounds good. Um, let's see who's next. We have. Da, 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 da. Donna St. George with the Washington Post. Can we hear her? Um, hi, can you hear me? There you are. Okay, yes, sounds good. Great. Yes. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Dr. Gales, could you please update us on how many contact investigations your office has conducted at non-public schools since mid-August and separately at public schools? And then secondly, um, are schools either public or non-public safe for reopening for small groups or for hybrid learning? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so since we last met last week, uh, the numbers provided, I think during the last week's session, we had achieved, I think, 55 visits at that point. Uh, since then, we have had, uh, since last Tuesday, uh, 19 separate investigations into uh, COVID-like illnesses or COVID, actually COVID-confirmed uh, cases. Uh, and if my, 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 my calculus is correct, uh, four of those had confirmed cases that were involved and required uh, further quarantining. Uh, and a good portion of those are actually ongoing now and information that we're bringing in right now to further inform the contact investigation process. Uh, but based upon my numbers, uh, since we last talked in our last briefing, I'm sorry, on last Wednesday, there have been 19 different uh, investigations launched 
and for those, the majority of those were COVID-like illnesses that have been ruled out with further testing, uh, but at least in four of those cases, they have involved uh, cases involving students, staff, and or teachers. Um, and again, we'll work to get further. We are working on, I know that you sent in a request last week for further information, the team is actually working to distill the information uh, to make it more uh, easily digestible in terms of breaking it down in terms of the number of students who were quarantined and impacted and affected uh, in each of those different cases. So please stay tuned on that. Uh, and in, in terms of public schools, and the public schools have not been in session. And again, not all of the non-public schools have been in session either. As we've, we've noted before, there have been instances where some of the schools are doing um, routine testing and they're picking up case positive cases there before folks come back into the school setting. Uh, and again, we have had, as we talked last week, I'm not aware of any additional cases since we last talked in our last briefing of any of the public school staff coming back positive. Um, and that, that's just the case in the last week. Uh, to transition in terms to what is safe in terms of moving forward. Uh, we've been very clear that we think and support the notion, or I think I uh, support the notion that in order to be effective and to move forward, we should see lower levels of community transmission. Uh, now, the, the state guidelines that have been provided to us from MDH and the State Department of Education, as well as informed by the most recently submitted uh, disseminated guidelines from the CDC, break numbers down in community transmission by your test positivity and your cases per 100,000 residents. And so if we look at the state guidelines, we have achieved a test positivity lower than 5%. We have not achieved a cases per 100,000 rate that is below five per 100,000. And so we still sit in a range where for the state guidelines, we would not be able to open back up fully schools would be able to open up in the sense of some type of hybrid model. Uh, and so, you know, non-public schools are looking at what that means further, as well as the public schools are looking at uh, their provisions to see if it's possible to be able to offer some opportunities for small group sessions to come back. Now, we have continued to provide guidance to both non-public and public schools uh, and are looking to discover, explore, and to support best practices that have been associated with schools reopening, not only in our jurisdiction, but across the state and the region, as well as across the country. And so we continue to look at advice, for example, uh, in terms of how do you integrate and incorporate regular routine testing as a part of strategies to bring teachers, students, and staff back. And we will continue to work with both our partners in the non-public setting and public school setting uh, to provide that guidance so that whatever decision is made and whatever model is selected in terms of bringing students back, we will be able to provide the most up-to-date guidelines to keep the students and staff safe. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Aisha from Fox 5 DC, now you're unmuted. All right, you can Hi. hear me now, perfect. <laughs> got it, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Technology, you gotta love it. Um, all right, I've got two questions um, for the county executive, um, or Dr. Gales can jump in as well. My first question is, have you had any recent conversations with MCPS? Um, what is the school system sharing with you currently, as in, you know, what is happening down the line as far as reopening is concerned? Because I was just exchanging emails with the PIO for MCPS. And for example, they're asking for supplemental funding regarding uh, work surrounding ventilation and HVAC filter upgrades, which is ongoing. So that's one part of the question. And the second part is, have you provided maybe a specific number to the uh, school system that would be, you know, a, a metric the county needs to hit in order to bring back in-person learning or even hybrid learning for that matter? So I can answer the first part only that I just saw the request yesterday and we're trying to figure out where to find the money from. And um, so there, you know, there may be some possible sources and that's what's being discussed is what's the best place uh, to try to find this. Obviously, we're, we're having a a revenue crunch like everybody else's. And so anything over and above um, of unplanned expenditures is you know, more difficult than usual right now. But we are, we are looking at it and we know this is something we need to do. And I'll let uh, Dr. Gales talk about 
communication because I've only seen their press conference and the joint statement from the union and the superintendent. Uh, well, t uh, I wanted to actually applaud the, the, the colleagues at MCBS. They have been working on um, safety plans uh, for months. Uh, and they've been at the table and they have reached out uh, for us to provide guidance from a public health perspective. Uh, Dr. Stoddard and I have met with them on, I think it's a biweekly basis to provide them with, you know, up-to-date guidance from a health and emergency preparedness perspective. Uh, and as you recall, we went on a, uh, we actually had a couple, a site visit where we walked through with them their, uh, you know, provisional plans to reopen uh, at that time. Uh, and I know that they've continued to work and refine those plans going from bringing back all students to potentially smaller groups of students. And I don't, so I don't think they've made any definitive uh, decisions on things because they continue to monitor the levels of community transmission. And they also continue to monitor uh, best practices for things they need to implement within their different environments to mitigate transmission as much as possible. So as it relates to particular metrics, again, I want to uh, call attention to the state guidelines that have been put forward from the governor's office and the State Department of Education. Uh, they have said they are using test positivity in cases per 100,000 as markers and ben benchmarks to do that as in, you know, in terms of guiding that conversation, but allowing jurisdictions to come up with their own particular plans to move forward. Now we do, as we currently stand, uh, when looking at those numbers, our test positivity falls below five, but our community transmission does remain on the higher end, closer to 10 as opposed to closer to five. Uh, and when you factor in the recent guidelines that were released by CDC, they actually are more specific. They include more measures, as well as their categories aren't quite as large in terms of below five for test positivity. And when looking at cases per 100,000, instead of saying below five and having below uh, five to 15, they actually break it down into smaller categories. And when you look at our profile based upon the CDC guidelines, we do have a fair amount of measures that fall into the lower transmission risk category. But when you look at, for example, our cases per 100,000, that falls into, I think it's the moderate to moderate high uh, risk of transmission categories. And so, I say all that to say that we have provided that guidance to MCPS and continue to update them in terms of where our numbers stand. And we also reflexively, as we've talked about before, continue to look at how we can refine our measures and make them more specific. Uh, and even if we don't have a definitive answer to say, well, if test positivity is 3.4 and cases are 5.6, then we move forward, but at least provide some general uh, categories. And so we're working on some updated algorithms Certainly in the setting, as we know, certain other jurisdictions have put out uh, language that they may be moving to some type of hybrid model. Uh, and so we continue to work with our colleagues across the region to inform what a particular, what a potential model or metrics would look like here. Uh, and so in the absence of having, you know, a definitive state cut off, uh, we continue to refine and continue to work with them to make sure they get the most recent up-to-date information. I would, I would only add, I think, um, in our conversations, what I, what I would expect that you will see, and again, this is a Board of Education decision on how exactly this gets rolled out, um, I, I would expect them to start relatively small and build out from there as they gain experience and comfort with their own procedures. I would expect there to be an early emphasis on the special populations, whether it be special needs, young learners, ESOL, or English as a second language uh, students. I would expect you'd start to see programming that's niche and then expand from there. Um, you know, the time frame will be something the school system has to determine based on when they can get to a safe set of procedures with their staff and faculty. But my, my guess is in the November time frame is when you'll start to see some of those programs if they can get them in, if they can get the procedures in place and the Board of Education approves them. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Rachel Chason with the Washington Post, and it is for Dr. Gales. Rachel? Hey, Dr. Gales, and for the county exec as well. Um, I was just wondering if you could sort of expand a bit on how concerned you all are about potential outbreaks at the White House and that we're now seeing on the Hill, and if you've seen any sort of uptick in the number of people who are either seeking testing because they've 
been associated with either of these places or um, if that's something that you expect. Well, it's hard to answer. I don't know the contact tracing details, so I don't know how many people live in Montgomery County or travel to Montgomery County. Um, and we don't know anything they've done since they've been here. So I think as we know more about contact tracing and if they release that kind of private information to us, I don't know how this will transpire. Um, we may have a better idea, but obviously a bunch of people got infected and didn't know about it for a while just like the person they got infected from apparently didn't tell anybody that there was something to worry about. So who knows what happens in their homes and communities. And from an epidemiologic standpoint, uh, we are, you know, we expect that we will see folks coming in to get tested and we may very well see uh, a, an increase in cases secondary to those exposures. We do know that over the weekend, uh, we did have a number of folks reach out to the state and to the uh, local jurisdiction asking where they could get testing, uh, in particular related to rapid testing. Uh, and we did provide a series of recommendations for folks uh, in places where they could go to get uh, said testing. Uh, but it, it is important to emphasize, as the county executive mentioned, it is not clear the extent to which contact tracing was completed. Uh, the extent to which individuals who were at risk based upon their exposures were notified and that information was shared with them. Uh, and so again, that's why we're encouraging folks who, if you are, if you worked in any of those settings or come into contact, um, have high risk contact with any individuals who were in those particular settings, we are encouraging you to get tested. Uh, and the, by the, the advantage of testing uh, within your home jurisdiction or wherever you test, but making sure that you test in, in venues that report that information to the state labs, is that if there is a positive case, that information is sent directly to the state labs and the contact tracers are notified and can begin the contact investigation process. So if we do find that there are cases secondary to that for Montgomery County residents, we will have the opportunity to conduct the contact tracing investigations and be able to find out if their particular cases, if they turn up positive, are associated with any of those activities that you mentioned. And if we do find that's the case, we will continue to work with our partner jurisdictions across the region uh, to inform their investigations should they have any and provide any relevant guidance to those entities that are affected. Rondi Bass with WDVM has a question for you, Dr. Gales. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me on the call today, Dr. Gales. We've got the election coming up in, in just about a month, and of course, some people will be voting in person. Are you concerned about potential contact tracing efforts or difficulties associated with COVID with so many people coming in and out of those voting centers? Um, since there are fewer than there have been in years past, more and more people will be at one center than they were in the past. Are you concerned about contact tracing or, or any other things related to COVID in the election? Well, that's an excellent question. It's a very timely question. Uh, and it's an important question because voting is a time-honored tradition. You know, I remember as a kid going with my parents uh, and when I was small enough, I could go with them in, the, into the voting booth uh, and experiencing that. So it's something that many people continue to carry with them. And it is a tradition of sorts. I mean, I actually even plan to vote in person myself, whether it's through early voting or on actual the, the voting day. I would like to commend the many folks in the county agencies and across the state who have worked tirelessly on planning uh, safe elections here in the county and thinking of all the different provision uh, uh, parameters and things like that that are needed for a safe experience. And we have continued to provide guidance to them in terms of what needs to be done to allow for, uh, as you mentioned, a large volume of folks to come into these spaces uh, to try to move them through quickly, but make sure that they move through safely. So yes, we certainly are concerned, but we also know that there's been tremendous work and strides made to keep the experience safe and to protect folks. Now, one of the interesting advantages of folks coming through uh, the voting process is, is that we would actually have a record of who was in attendance uh, because you've got to confirm that you were there. Um, and so if, if there were potential cases that happened or if something come, pops up, 
we that would actually help facilitate uh, the contact tracing process because we would know who was there, we would have a sense of when they were there, and we would be able to notify those individuals as quickly as possible if there was any potential risk of exposure. Uh, yeah, I, I would just only add to Dr. Gale's comments. We've been preparing for this for months. Uh, we've been, you know, installing plexiglass. We've been training our election judges. We've been doing every every activity that we could possibly think of that would make this voting experience as safe as possible. You will see physical distance in the lines that will make the lines much longer than they would be in past years because of the distancing requirements. You, 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 we have processes throughout the voting process that actually we've reviewed the the, the layouts of all the facilities, public health will be doing walkthroughs of several of the facilities to, to try and point out any last minute things that we can see. The same is true of the places where we're uh, uh, de-enveloping the mail-in ballots. People will be observing those in a physically distanced way. Um, we, we've, we've tried to think of every possible um, opportunity for exposure and, and I think we have a high degree of confidence that uh, we've got a system in place that will protect people and, and allow them to um, take advantage of their 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 right to vote. Brianna Adikusuma from Bethesda Bead has questions for Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard. Brianna. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to get some quick clarification on the soccer cases. Um, I know you said the Potomac Soccer Club team. Uh, just to clarify, are you referring to the Potomac Soccer Association and uh, which high school team um, was involved as well? Um, and are they related? Did they play a game together? Um, and Dr. Stoddard, can you give us more insight into what safety precautions are being discussed about being put in place for tournaments? So really it's uh, the Potomac Soccer Club is the information that I have uh, that relates to uh, the potential cases affiliated with that group uh, and uh, the potential uh, exposures were related to a soccer match uh, between two teams uh, and um, so that that's the relevant information uh, that we're, we're able to share right now uh, as an answer to your question. And for the soccer tournament issue, it's still a work in progress. Uh, we've been working with Visit Montgomery, who is in part uh, coordinate, helping to coordinate the, the conduct of the potential tournament. Um, we are likely going to have a regiment that includes um, obviously the same thing, cleanings, uh, temperature checks. We, we likely are going to incorporate a requirement for them to have done a testing in, in, the, in the days preceding their attendance to the tournament. While this is not a perfect solution, we're trying to try and find, this is, these are similar things to what we've done previously with uh, some of the uh, professional leagues. We had the U.S. Women's Amateur Golf Tournament in Montgomery County earlier this year. Uh, similarly, we've had other, uh, the uh, Washington Spirit play, you know, play and we, we provide requirements there. And so uh, we will work with them to develop a set of uh, guidelines that are they're that are commiserate to, to the nature of their tournament, uh, corresponding the testing to their travel to the county uh, and preceding play and having to have a requirement that they have a negative test before they participate. Uh, we can provide more details as those are being finalized. It's, an act, it's something we're actively working on this week and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, something more clear for the next time we talk. Okay. That is about the number of questions from reporters. These media briefings are for the journalists. And I think we're going to wrap it up. Reporters going once, twice. We're done for the day. We'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Have a good day.